So we define some few terms. What is a market? It's a group of buyers and sellers of a particular product. Um, remember, we say here that market is not uh, a place. Okay, as some people think that hey, I'm going to the market means you are going to a particular place. Uh, we think of market as a group of buyers. Actually, any effective arrangement that brings buyers and sellers together. If you are starting a business and people wanted to be sure if your product will sell, they will ask you whether you think there is market for your product. Okay, they are not asking whether there is a particular place where you can go, but whether there are a group of buyers okay, to buy your product. So that's the idea of market in economics. And what is competitive market? Okay. A competitive market is a market with right, many buyers and many sellers. Each has a negligible effect on price. So when we say market is competitive, there are so many buyers, so many sellers. So a single seller cannot influence the price of the product or a single buyer cannot use his purchasing power to change the market price because we are all very, very tiny component of the market. There are so many buyers and sellers. Okay. Now, when we add perfectly here, okay, to a competitive market, we assume all goods are exactly the same. For example, maize or corn from Tamale looks identical or exactly the same as maize or corn from Ejura in the Ashanti region. Okay. So we assume when we say perfect competitive, we assume there are many buyers and sellers, all goods are exactly the same. And the buyers and the sellers are price takers. We'll take, talk more about these things, okay? But just keep in mind that a price taker is not a price maker and therefore cannot change or influence the price, okay? So in this section, as we talk about demand and supply, we assume that all, um, uh, buyers and sellers are price takers okay we assume we are in a perfectly competitive market let's keep defining key terms what do we mean by quantity demanded okay so this is usually a number okay a number quantity demanded did you demand 10 copies of a book or five and so on so quantity demanded of any good is the amount of good that the buyers are willing and able to purchase you should be willing to purchase and you should be able, okay, able here means you have the money, the wherewithal to be able to afford, okay, what you want to, uh, you are willing to afford or buy. And that is the idea of quantity demanded. Remember, you should be willing and able to purchase. What is the law of demand? Don't forget this. It is that the claim that the quantity demanded of a good falls when the price of the good rises other things be equal. Okay, we'll talk about this more later. But we all know that when the price of an iPhone is very high, people buy less, quantity demanded is, is fewer. And when the price of a good or iPhone or tomatoes is low, people tend to buy more. Okay, so when the price falls, quantity demanded goes up. It's an inverse relationship, okay, negative. And when the price falls, people buy more. That's the idea of the law of demand. We cannot identify with that easily. Now, the demand schedule is also another key term. Now, you know what we mean by quantity demanded. What is a demand schedule? It's just a table like this, which shows the price of the item and the quantity that is demanded at that price. Okay, so at the price of zero, Let's say I demand 16 boxes of pizza at the price of five. I demand six boxes and so on. That is what we call um, demand schedule. Okay, so please don't forget. Now we can take the schedule onto a graph, right? You plot, this is what, zero and 16, the first one. The next is one and 14. Okay, we typically put price on the vertical axis and quantity demanded on the horizontal axis, which is a convention. So please don't forget them, don't switch them. And if you plot this, so this is the second one. 
1 and 14. Let's look at the last one, 6 and 4. So price is 6. Quantity demanded is 4. Okay, this is 4. So when we plot them on the, the demand schedule, we take the demand schedule to a graph. Okay, when we plot them, we have what we call the demand curve. So you know a demand schedule, which is the table here. Okay, now you know a demand curve. Okay, and notice that it's negatively sloped. The slope of this line is negative. If you can calculate the slope, you will see that it's negative. And it is showing the relationship between price and quantity demanded, which is carried by the law of demand. That you see as the price goes up, as the price goes up, quantity demanded is falling. At the price of one, they demand 14. But as the price goes to six, they demand only four. Okay. So don't forget what a demand schedule is. Don't forget what a demand curve is. There's another term we call the market. Okay. So this table here, these two columns, we define Helen's quantity demanded for a product, say pizza. And then you can have this column and this column defining Edmond's quantity demanded of pizza at the price of one. Helen will demand 14 boxes at the price of one. Helen demands seven. Assuming they are the only two people on the market. Then at the price of one, we have 21 boxes demanded, 14 plus seven. And that de defines the market demand. Okay. So this is an individual, individual, but they are the only two on the market. If you horizontally sum the individual demands, you get the, the individual quantity demanded, you get the market. So keyword is market. What we saw earlier is individual demand. Okay. Of course, we can also take the market demand curve onto a graph, sorry, the market demand schedule onto a graph and that is called a market demand curve. So you know what quantity demanded is, you know the law of demand, you know what a demand schedule is, you know what a demand curve is, you know what a market demand schedule is, you are now seeing a market demand curve. Some the individual quantity demanded at each price, you arrive at the market, okay? It should make it to sense, okay? Now, you should always know a demand curve looks something like this. Let me open to a blank sheet. So basically a uh, demand curve looks like this, negatively slope, don't forget we write D to mean demand curve, which put prices here and quantity demanded here. So the higher the price, the lower the quantity, the lower the price, the higher the quantity. Please note that any number here is bigger than any number here because this is on the right side of this. So if this is 10, this, is, this number will definitely be greater than 10. So when I keep saying, the, uh, so any number here is also smaller than any number here. So when you hear me say the lower the price, the higher the quantity, I mean this number is bigger than this. And the higher the price means this number is also bigger than this. So the higher the price here, we have the lower the quantity. Lower means it's relative to this quantity here. Now, we are going to this demand curve as I just saw. For example, if this is point A, you can move from here, assuming this is 10, and this is also 10. So at a price of 10, quantity demanded is 10. This could be point A. And you could have a point B, where this is 20, and this is probably eight, point B. So you can move along the same demand curve, okay? People can move at a price of 10, they buy 10. When a price drops to 8, they buy 20. So that is what we call movement along the demand curve. There's another related concept called shifting, where the demand curve bodily shifts, okay? So this is a change in demand, what I just drew. Later, we'll talk about the technical ways, okay? 
So this is a change in demand. Uh, it's actually an increase in demand. And if the demand curve was, were to shift inward like this, leftward, whatever, we call this a decrease in demand. So no an increase in demand and a decrease in demand. These are called shifts, shifting of the demand curve. Whilst moving from point B to point C, for example, is called movement along the same curve. You cannot forget this. You should not take this class without knowing the difference between shifting of demand curve and moving along the same demand curve. Okay, let me go back to the slides. Okay, so that's what we call shifters. What are some of the things that can shift the demand curve? Okay, remember we said the law of demand says the higher the price, the lower the quantity demanded, other things being equal. Other things being equal is also called Ketris parables. Okay, some people pronounce it Ceteris, Ceteris paribus, meaning other things being equal. So you hold other things that affect demand constant. That's the idea of other things constant. Okay, if you say, oh, when the price of ice cream increases, people will buy less ice cream. Then somebody will raise a protest that no, what if their salary also increases? They might not buy less, they might buy more, even when the price of ice cream has gone up. And then you say, oh, no, 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 I'm not talking about increase in income. Aha, uh -huh. that's the idea of other things being equal. You are saying, well, let me assume their income hasn't changed. Let me assume the weather hasn't changed, their tastes haven't changed. And I'm just saying when the price of ice cream goes up, they buy less. That's the idea of other things being equal. You are holding other things like income, tastes, and preferences constant, okay? They are the same, holding them, other things being equal. We call that the Latin phrase, catris parables or ceteris parables, other things being equal. It is these other things, what am I talking about on this slide? The shifters. That is that shift the demand here. An increase or a decrease. It is the other things that when they change, we see a bodily shift in the demand curve. So what are these? Let's go over them. Now, you agree with me that when the number of buyers increases, then there is a shift in the demand curve at each price so this is the old demand curve in gray here at the price of six five units or let's say six units were bought if the number of buyers were to increase okay suppose the number of buyers increases then at each price by the way this p will denote price q d will be quantity demanded QS will be quantity supplied and so on. So at each price, quantity demanded will increase. We are just picking an example of five here. Okay, just increasing by five. So assuming we have five more buyers. Okay, what's the point here? The number of buyers, when that increases, we see a shift in the demand curve. Of course, it is an outward shift, meaning an increase in demand. This is an increase in demand. This is a decrease in demand, do not forget that. So assuming there were five new buyers, each bought one at each price, then remember at price of six, we had six quantity demanded being six, and we think of it as having increased to 11. So at each of their prices, there's an increase in quantity demanded. So eventually it leads to a shift in the demand curve, okay, as the arrow shows. So don't forget this, number of buyers shifts the demand curve, okay? It could be when the number of buyers increases, that's an increase in demand. If the number of buyers were to decrease, then we see an inward shift, a decrease in demand, okay? Pardon the way I drew it. Another determinant of the position of the demand curve, okay? Another shifter is the income. 
when people's income change, the demand curve shifts. But before then, let's define some key terms. Okay. As an economist, you must know what a normal good is. A normal good is positively related to income. In other words, when your income increases, you buy more of such goods. Okay. Such goods are called normal goods. When your income increases and you buy more of cars, then cars will be referred to as normal goods. Okay. Usually in the US, students who eat a lot of Indomie when they don't have money, when they have money, they eat steak or beef or a lot of meat. So over the meat will be considered a normal good. And noodles, okay, will be inferior goods. Okay, so that transitions us into inferior, as the name suggests, when you become richer, you have more money, you buy less of that good, that's inferior. In Ghana, you can think of Gary. People think of it as inferior good. That when incomes increase, they buy less of Gary. And then you can think of also beef or eating at an expensive restaurant as a normal good or cars. Okay, when their incomes go up, they buy more of the good. Any good you can think of, you can come up with your own examples. You might just have to convince us that, look, this is a normal good because when incomes go up, people buy more. Or this is inferior, when incomes go up, people buy less. Okay. Now, this tends to shift the demand curve. Of course, for a normal good, when the income increases, this is the demand for a normal good like cars. When incomes increase, then there's an increase in demand for cars. So income also shifts the demand curve. If there were a decrease in income, then the demand curve shifts inward. So please don't, do not think it is only one way, one direction we are talking about. We've listed the first one, number of buyers, it shifts the demand curve. Second one is the income. Okay, the income effect here would depend on whether the good is normal or inferior. For inferior, increase in income leads to a decrease. For a normal good, increase in income leads to an outward shift. Okay, remember we are still talking about the shifters. There is another shift of the demand curve called prices of related goods. You know, goods are usually related to each other in the way consumers react to prices. So as the name suggests, two goods are substitute, right? If they are substitute, one can do the work the other is doing. So they are substitute. Okay, now let's think about it slowly. Two goods are substitute. If an increase in price of one, think about it, increase here, causes an increase in demand for the other. So two words, increase, increase. One, we talk about price, one, we talk about demand. So I hope you can picture it. Okay, two goods are substitute. If when one price goes up, it increases demand for the other. Because people will move away from them, a relatively expensive good towards the cheaper one. Pepsodent and close-up are substitute goods. If the price of Pepsodent should go up, people will move away from Pepsodent and move towards close-up. So an increase in price of Pepsodent will increase demand for close-up. And then you will see that the demand curve for close-up will increase, right? It has shifted it. So prices are related. Goods are related as substitute. For example, Coke and Pepsi okay, are also substitute. And we have a few more examples, laptops and desktops. Some are really great substitute. Some are substitute, but not so great. <laughs> Another type of related goods is complement. Okay, as the English word suggests, two goods are complement. Remember in the substitute, we saw increase, increase. Here, look at the words, increase and fall. That's when the goods are complement. An increase in the price of one causes a decrease or fall in demand for the other. Because they move together, they are complements. If shoes are expensive, people may buy less socks. 
because they, are, they will buy more socks if they buy more shoes. So you can think of those as complements. Okay, they are used together jointly. They complement each other. So once one becomes expensive, they won't buy the other one. That is why an increase in price of one causes a fall in demand for the other. There's a common example we give in secondary schools in Ghana, the touch light. The touch light and the battery, battery. Touch light and battery. Okay, touch light and battery. They are complement. If touch light is expensive, they will not buy more and they will buy less battery. So an increase in price of one leads to a fall in demand for the other. If the goods are related that way, we call them complement. Okay, so now you know normal goods, inferior goods. You can relate to them in everyday life. You know substitutes and you know complement. Okay, take your time and think through multiple examples. So another shift of the demand curve. By the way, if two goods are substitutes, Let's say there is Coke. This is the price of Coke, quantity demanded. Think of a related good like Pepsi. If Pepsi is expensive, it will inure to the benefit of Coke. So an increase in demand for Coke. Okay. So um, prices of related goods is a shift of the demand curve. Think about taste. When taste favor a particular good, there is increase in demand for it. If the taste move away from a particular good, there is decrease in demand for that good. Okay. When we had color, colored TV or the black and white popular, the black and white popular in the 90s, taste changed to colored TV, and then you see an increase in demand for colored TV and a decrease in demand for the black and white TV. And then there is a shift in taste towards flat screen. So if I were to draw the demand curve for flat screen TV, you will see that the taste is favoring them. So there is increase in demand. And if you have the demand curve for color TV, okay, uh, the one which is not flat or the black and white, you will experience, you will see that there's a decrease in demand. So yeah, tastes affect the shifting of the demand curve. Okay, the shift. And then expectations. If you expect your income to go up, you may increase your demand for cars or food from expensive restaurant. If you expect you to lose your job, you adjust your demand and there is decrease in demand. So expectations also, okay, affect or shift the demand curve. This is a summary. Okay, and there's a very, very important information here. Pay attention. We've just gone through this. Things that shift the demand curve, shift, demand curve, shift, 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 shift. Expect, uh, number of buyers, income, price of related goods, tastes, expectation. They all shift. Pay attention, please. They all shift the demand curve. Look at this. This is they didn't use the word shift here. They said price of causes a movement along the demand curve. So when the price of an item changes, it does not cause a shift. Please pay attention, it is very crucial, especially those who have never taken economics. When the price of a good changes, it doesn't shift the demand curve. It causes a movement along the demand curve, okay? So look at this. If you are talking about Coca-Cola, and this is the price of Coke, Coca-Cola, which has changed, the demand curve will not shift. It's going to move you from one point on the demand curve to the other. Okay, that is what we call the own price. If the own price of the item changes, there is just a shift, a movement, sorry, I beg your pardon, a movement along the same demand curve. Do not forget. The only time it shifts is what? The country's parables list, all other things here, number of buyers, income. So throughout the course, we will not shift a curve if its own price changes. There will be a movement along the same curve. Okay. So we can have a practice here. Okay. We have been asked to draw a demand curve 
for music download. Downloading music, okay, onto an iPad and listening or iPod and listening versus using a CD, playing the music directly from a CD. What happens to each of the following scenarios and why? So draw a demand curve, pay attention what you are being asked to. You have to draw a demand curve for music download. So when you draw the demand curve, you put price here. It is the price for what? Music download. And this is quantity demanded of music download. That's it. Always know your demand curve looks like this. You label it. So we've done that. What happens when there's a when the price of iPod falls? You are downloading the music onto an iPod. Now iPods have become cheaper. So what happens? Okay, let's see. Music downloads and iPods are complements. They go together. You download it onto the iPod. So if iPods are cheaper then people will download more. So there is an increase in demand. Okay. That is why there is an outward shift in the demand curve. Okay. What about scenario B? The price of music download falls. Remember this price here is the price of music download. So if the same own price, it's own, the own price has changed, there'll be no shift. It's a movement along the same curve. Remember this. The demand curve does not shift. I've said this over and over. There's just a movement down along the curve. The price has fallen from P1 to P2. So we move from point A to point B. Price has fallen. The law of demand says there'll be increase in demand, quantity demand. Okay. Third scenario, price of CDs fall. Remember, you can either play music directly from CD or you download onto an iPod. So CDs and then downloads are substitutes. Therefore, when CDs are cheaper, then people will play more on CDs and therefore there'll be a decrease in demand for music downloads. People are now using the CDs because prices are we've been told have fallen. Okay. You can always ask questions when we meet in class. Okay. All right, folks, we are switching from demand to supply. Once you get a concept um, with the demand, we can go fairly quickly through supply also. Okay, so what is um, do we mean by quantity supply of any good? It is the amount that sellers are willing and able to sell. Remember, quantity demanded was what the amount that buyers were willing and able to buy. Here, the quantity that sellers are also willing and able to sell is quantity supply. What is the law of supply? Pay attention here. The law of demand led to what a negatively slow demand curve. The law of supply, as you will see, will lead to a positively slope. Okay, what's the law of supply? It says that is a claim that the quantity supplied of a good rises when the price of the good rises. Again, other things being equal. So here, unlike demand, where the higher price leads to a, a lower um, quantity demanded, here we have a positive relationship. The higher the price, Producers are happy that they are going to get higher revenues, so they supply more. So the higher the price, the higher the quantity supplied. The prices go up, they are happy, so they sell more, they supply more. That's how can we have a positive supply curve. As usual, this will be called a supply schedule. Assuming this is Eddie's pizza at the price of one, they supply three boxes. When prices of pizza should go to six dollars, they will supply 18 boxes. So this is a supply schedule. Okay, let's not spend time on that. It was clear. When you take the schedule onto a graph, we call it a supply curve. I've already let you in into the slope. 
that is going to be positively sloped. And as usual, we have individual supply schedule. When you add all the individuals on the market, we have a market supply schedule like this. So a horizontal summation okay, of the individual demand, quantity demand that gives us the market. Sorry, sorry, sorry. It's not demand, supply, quantity supply. We are in supply now. So if you add individual, this is purpose pizza and pizza in. If you sum their quantity supplied at each price, you get a market quantity supply. We can take the market quantity supply onto a graph and we call that a market supply curve. Okay, so that becomes a market supply curve as you are seeing for the entire market, not just an individual. Now, again, we'll go through the things that shift the supply curve. The supply curve is like that. There could be an increase in supply. There could be a decrease in supply. There could also be a movement along the same supply curve. And you know by now what can cause a movement along the supply curve. Okay. When the price, the own price of the item changes, there's movement along the same supply curve. But if the other things being equal, okay, all other things, the other factors change, we can see a shift in the supply curve. It could be an increase in supply or a decrease. Okay, so let's go through those things quickly. One, input prices. Okay, think about this. When input prices, what are your input? Cost of raw materials and so on. When wages, cost of raw materials are cheaper, you can produce more, okay? So a fall in the input prices, <clears throat> sorry, makes production more profitable at each output price. So firms will supply a larger quantity. Okay, so that shifts the supply curve to the right and that's an increase in supply. If input prices become very expensive, then you can imagine will have a decrease in supply. By the way, it is not pardonable to draw a supply curve like this. You have given it a negative slope. That's supposed to be demand, not supply. Once you change them, you, everything is wrong because we don't know whether you know it or not. So be careful. What is another shift of the supply curve? Technology, right? If there's a technology that makes production cheaper, or you get more for the same input, then you'll be able to supply more at each price level. Okay. So technology, a cost-saving technology, okay, has the same effect as a fall in input prices. If there is a technology that is discovered that is supposed to save you cost, okay, or at the same price or the same input. For example, they said, oh, want to uh, produce uh, maybe more uh, rice, then soak the seeds of the rice in water for seven days before you plant. It could be a new technology. Remember there are BT technologies for cotton planting. For example, if that's a technology improvement, that can enable you produce more. At the same price, you have a technology allows you to produce more. There could be technologies that save cost. Maybe harvesting apples, you have to climb the tree and use catalyst to plug. What if there is some technology that helps you to you know, plug the apples fairly quickly? So you use less cost and then you are able to supply more apple. Okay, so I hope this, this is easy to appreciate that technology, a cost saving technology, for example, okay, will act as a fall in input prices and that can uh, increase supply. If your technology is bad, it increases your cost of production and you may have to supply less. Okay, so it will be decreasing supply in that instance. Of course, it is straightforward to appreciate that the number of sellers okay, will always increase or decrease supply. If the number of sellers increases an increase in supply number of sellers decrease, there's a decrease in supply. 
Now, when we say increase in supply, you must know what we mean. This is increase in supply. And this is a decrease in supply. Expectations will also affect what producers are bringing on the market for sale. They can hoard some and supply a few or supply more depending on the expectations. Okay. If there's going to be a boom in oil, then you may want to supply more quickly and so on. On the other hand, if you ex they expect prices to go up, what do they do? They hide what they have or uh, they hurt them. When prices go up, they bring them for sale. So expectations also increase, change how much sellers are willing and able to supply. And of course, that's a shifting of the supply curve. Okay. So this is a summary of the things that shift. Remember, the own price doesn't shift. It causes a movement, but input prices, technology, number of sellers' expectations, they all shift the supply curve. Remember, there could be an increase in supply or decrease in supply. Now we are going to practice here. So let's take our time. We are supposed to draw the supply curve for Kantan Kaka. Straight for you must know what to do. Do this, put a price for Kantan Kaka and quantity supplied. And you know it's supply. It says supply curve, so it's going to look positively sloped. You label it supply. And we are to discuss each of the following scenarios. <clears throat> okay, I beg your pardon. Now, retailers are those who sell the cars. So if retailers cut the price of the car, so it is the own price that has been cut. Maybe it was here, P1, Q1, they cut their price down. This is P1 to P2. As you can see, um, if the price goes down, we meet the supply curve here. So we were at point A, we are now at point B. Quantity supply has decreased, right? Remember the law of supply. Producers are not happy when the price falls. It reduces their revenue, so they supply less. So that's what will happen at A. And what happens in B? There's a technological advance that allows the cars to be produced at a lower cost. Of course, that's going to increase supply, okay? Now, commercial drivers raise the price of the services they provide. Let's go through the answers. We've talked about this already. When the price of the Kantanka car falls, it is the own price. So the supply curve does not shift. There is a movement along the curve. Okay. It's a movement along the curve. B, there's a technology that allows the cars to be produced at a cheaper cost. Definitely it increases supply. So we see an outward shift of the supply curve. Third scenario, commercial drivers raise their prices. Okay, this has nothing to do with supply. This shifts the demand curve rather, right? So commercial drivers have raised, raised their price. Commercial drivers may be using Kantanka cars have increased their price. So those who take troll, troll, whatever, will not take commercial vehicles that are Kantanka actually on the demand side okay so it has nothing to do with the supply curve remember we are supposed to be talking about supply of kantanka cars okay so pay attention to this things you can go over again you have the videos and the slides okay i hope you are following so far okay now we've seen demand and supply the next thing we want to do is to put them together and talk about some interesting things, okay? And then this um, lecture would come to an end to we'll move to the next set uh, in another video. But putting demand and supply together, remember, think of this as a market demand and market supply. 
there is this concept of equilibrium where demand and supply intersect and this becomes the equilibrium price this becomes a equilibrium quantity okay at this point quantity demanded is equal to quantity supply so this 15 here is actually quantity demanded is the same as quantity supply okay it's equilibrium price okay and it's called a market clearing price we will see more later okay so this is what i was saying like a schedule like this look at where quantity demanded is equal to quantity supply this is where they are equal to 15 so equilibrium price or market clearing price is three and the equilibrium quantity demanded or quantity supply is 50 is the price this is the price at which the market clears okay at this point there is no excess supply there is no excess demand okay we call the market clearing price okay now and the market clearing price we saw previously here i've said quantity supply equals to quantity demanded okay look at that's price three look at price two here for example quantity they demanded 18 they supplied 10 so there is a shortage they are demanding 18 the yeah, market is supplying 10, there is a shortage. Here, they are demanding 12, they are supplying 20. This is excess supply or surplus. Okay. It is here that there is no shortage, there is no surplus. That is the idea of a market clearing price or equilibrium price, where quantity supply equals to quantity demanded. So let's look at what happens I've heard from the introductory lecture that we talk about invisible hand of demand and supply where it is not a government parastatal or a government body determining the price of tomatoes, for example. In a free market, we allow demand and supply to interact. Buyers and sellers interact and they arrive at the equilibrium or the market clearing price. Okay. So in this section, we look at what happens if there is a surplus. For example, something happens, uh, maybe there's a huge rainfall and there's too much harvest of maize or tomatoes. So there's excess supply or surplus. What happens? What happens through the market where the invisible hand that guides the interaction of buyers and sellers leads us to a market clearing price. So it is not an individual or a government controlling prices is about the interaction of supply and demand. What happens when there is excess supply for the market to clear? What happens? Let's go through that right here. So look, at the price of five, what is quantity demanded? Go to the demand curve. Then they demand nine, right? This is nine. Then go to the supply curve and read. That's 25. So at the price of five, quantity demanded is nine supply is 25 so definitely there is surplus or excess supply what happens for the market to clear how do you get rid of the surplus okay how do you get rid of it some of you may have guessed already there's surplus so what happens you sellers reduce the price they may reduce their price to four for example do you see this big gap here the gap has reduced shrunk they can reduce the price to 3.5. It reduces the surplus, reduces the surplus until three, where the surplus goes away if the market has cleared. Okay. So that's how demand and supply interact through the invisible hand. Okay. So that's what we have here more formally. So we say facing a surplus, sellers try to increase sales by cutting price. Okay, we all have traded before we know these things. When they cut price, what happens? Quantity demanded rises. Quantity demanded is rising from the nine is increasing. Quantity supplied is falling. Once you are cutting price, remember the law of supply. Sellers don't like lower prices. So they too, as you cut the price, okay, 
supply reduces until they meet here in the equilibrium. Okay, so that's how excess supply or surplus gets cleared. Let's look at the other instance where there's a shortage or excess demand. Here, consumers demand more than has been produced or supplied. So take the price of one, for example, as price one. What is supply? Go to the supply curve, it's five. What is quantity demanded is over here, 21. So at the price of one, quantity demanded is 21. Quantity supplied is five. So clearly there is excess demand or shortage. How do you get rid of this? Okay, there's shortage. People really need their goods. They are queuing for it. They are co making calls. I need some, there's shortage. So naturally price will tend to go up. That reduces the surplus, reduces the surplus, sorry, sorry. Reduces the shortage, reduces the shortage. Prices goes up, okay. As price goes up, sellers are happy they produce more. And some marginal consumers are also knocked off the market, okay. So, facing a shortage, sellers raise the price, quantity demanded will fall. Some people may not be able to afford anymore. Quantity supplied will rise because sellers are happy. They are seeing higher prices and this reduces the shortage. So this is how demand and supply interact, okay? To clear a surplus by a shortage and to get equilibrium price and quantity. Okay. So this is just to illustrate. Okay, now the analysis we just did were about kind of moving along the curves. We didn't shift any, okay? There are scenarios we have to shift the curve and analyze and analyze what happens to equilibrium price and quantity. So this is some three steps to guide us. We need to, when we look at the scenario, we need to decide whether we want to shift the supply curve or the demand curve. Sometimes we have to shift both. If it's shifting, are we shifting increase or we are shifting a decrease? You have to decide. And then you use a diagram to decide on your final equilibrium price and quantity. Okay. Now let's take, all right folks, so um, let's take a look at a scenario here, market for hybrid cars. Hybrid cars use both electricity and um, petrol, okay, or gas. So let's look at this market. These are the price of hybrid cars and quantity of hybrid cars. The idea is that when petrol is expensive, people want to buy more hybrid cars because they can charge it with electricity and drive around and so on. Okay, so let's look at what happens. There's an increase in the price of petrol price. What will happen? Then there will be an increase in demand for hybrid cars. Petro is expensive. They want a hybrid car that they can use electricity. Okay. So that's it. So there is a shift in demand. We move from D1 to D2. Now look for the new intersection. So prices go up eventually. And we move from Q1 to Q2. If once there's increase in the price of petrol, now we are moving to the hybrid market price for hybrid cars will go up. Then equilibrium, so equilibrium price goes up, equilibrium quantity also goes up. They produce more hybrid cars or more hybrid cars are the bought and eventually the price goes up. Okay, so if you are like a finance minister, the president asks you what happens to the market for hybrid cars if petrol prices should go up? Then you say, sir, uh, when petrol prices go up, I expect that people will demand more hybrid cars. And that will increase demand for hybrid cars depicted by the outward shift in the demand curve. Then he says, sir, there's a new equilibrium. The new equilibrium price is that is higher and quite equilibrium quantities also higher. 
Okay, that's where the, the new market clears. You used to be here, we are now here. Okay, let's look at another scenario. Okay, now be careful, do not shift supply curve if you don't have to. Okay, nothing in the scenario called for shifting supply curve. It's only petrol price that went up. Okay, if you practice this as you get it, and some will be on the homework. Okay, now, I'll come back to this slide here, slide 50, but let me move on and come back there. Take this scenario. There is a, we are still in the hybrid market. There's a new technology which reduces cost of producing hybrid cars. Here, we've learned that technology, okay, shifts supply curve. It doesn't shift demand curve, okay? So here is a supply curve that shift. What is our new equilibrium price? It has fallen and equilibrium quantity has gone up. Okay. Once there's a technology that reduces cost of production, then there will be increase in supply. So you shift that and look, look at the graphs, the new intersection, the new equilibrium price is lower, the new equilibrium quantity is higher. Okay, so that's it. And there are other examples we mix a shift in supply and a shift in demand. This is one such example. Okay. Look at the scenario. The price of gas or petrol has increased. We saw that that would shift the demand curve. Then in addition, there's a new technology that reduces production costs. Of course, the technology that reduces production costs will also lead to an increase in supply. So here, demand curve shifted, supply curve shifted. Let's look for the new equilibrium. We were at S1, D1's intersection. We are now at S2, D2's intersection. Okay, so you can see clearly quantity has gone up. We were at Q1, we are now at Q2. Okay, so the quantity rises, but we cannot tell that the price has gone up, the equilibrium price. So we say the price, the effect on price is ambiguous, okay? Although you can see P2 above P1, it doesn't mean it will always be the case. Remember, there is a way I can draw the S2 such that the new equilibrium will be below P1. For example, forget about this S2. Let me draw a bigger shift in the S. So we are here. S2. Then look at where S2 and D2 intersect here. Uh -huh, this is a new equilibrium. So P2 will now be below P1. That's why we say it's ambiguous, depending on the magnitude of the shift. Look at a smaller shift is here, but a bigger shift like this causes the dislocation of the P2. So whenever you shift both the demand and supply curve in an analysis, one of them, either the price or the quantity will be ambiguous. You will need more information. And with experience, you will know. Here I was able to tell, right? You can see clearly from Q1 to Q2, it's going to stay like that. No matter how you shift the red lines, right? No matter how you shift them, they are going to go past Q1. But the price, you can just look and you will know, okay? This is, this, this is also showing an example like I just did, that price P2 can actually be below P1. Okay, so this example here is for you to practice shift in supply and demand. The answers are, are also provided, so you'll be able to tell. Okay, if you have questions, ask me. Let me move to the slide I skipped right here. Now, this is very important. We, just, we talk about these terms. Shift and movement. We know a shift is a bodily shift of the demand or supply curve. And we know what a movement along the same curve is. Okay, movement along the same curve. Now, look at this. Change in supply. Change in quantity supply. They are not the same. They, they, they introduced the word quantity here. 
When you hear change in supply, it's a shift in the supply curve. When you hear change in quantity supply, that's a movement along the same supply curve. So these are technical ways you can speak. People know whether you know economics or not. Now the same thing, change in demand. Once I hear change in demand, there's a shift in the demand curve. When I hear change in quantity demanded, it's a movement along the same curve. Okay. So that is it. So that it, when you go back to the video, you will know that you will realize I was very careful when I was talking about change in supply and change in quantity supply. Okay, let me bring an example to, uh, and when you say change in demand, it means things like the number of buyers, the expectations, income, price or related, all those shifted. There are those that may have changed. But when you hear change in quantity demand, it's straightforward, it is the own price that has changed. That is why it is a movement along the same curve. Okay, now let me share a document and type something on it. And let's go through that. Um, I'm looking for a word document like this. Okay, so I'm going to type here something. Don't, don't worry about what is there. So let's say somebody said there is an. And so there is an increase in demand for ice cream because ice cream prices have gone up. Statement one. Two. There is an increase in quantity demanded of ice cream because ice cream prices have gone up. Let me make this decrease. And this also decrease. Decrease. It's a decrease in demand for ice cream because ice cream prices have gone up. There is a decrease in quantity demanded of ice cream because ice cream prices have gone up. There is a decrease in demand for ice cream because Incomes have fallen. Now, statement three is correct. Statement two is correct. Statement one is not. They said decrease in demand. Straightforward. That's a shift in the demand curve. And it cannot come from the own price of ice cream. That's why this statement is not correct. The statement suggests the own price of ice cream has changed. Therefore, it must be the language of quantity demanded, not decrease in demand. That's why two is correct. There is a decrease in quantity demanded of ice cream because ice cream prices, yes. Because once it's ice cream price that has changed, it's a movement along the same curve. And you must use the language of quantity demanded. Here, we attribute the decrease in demand to income not own price. Therefore, I'm free to use a shift in demand language. That's decrease in demand. I don't need to say decrease in quantity demand. No, because it is not the own price that's changed. So a little bit of, you know, um, nuanced language here. Just be careful and so on. So that will bring us to the end of this lecture. See you in the next class. Thank you.